What's going on, man? Welcome back to The Basement. I'm Ron, and today we're going to talk through my top 15 Dynasty rookie rankings for this 2024 draft class. We've already spent all of the offseason talking through what makes Caleb Williams so special, what makes Marvin Harrison Jr. so special, but I want to break down the team fits, the draft capital these players got, so how I sort of view these players now that we actually have teams attached to them. And then on top of that, I want this to be a little bit of a strategy video as well. I'm about... I don't know. I have 11 or 12 dynasty leagues. I've probably made about eight or nine picks in rookie drafts. Some are wrapping up as we speak, but I kind of want to talk through where I see the value tiers and gaps as well. So we're going to do a tier list here, kind of break down where I see the value pockets of the draft, where I'm trying to trade to and how I'm just sort of treating all of my rookie picks right now and kind of just how I see the landscape of the first round of rookie drafts in that early second area. So with all that being said, if you enjoy, make sure you down below, subscribe, leave a like, let's go. Now, as always, I have my top 50 rookie rankings all on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. That is... You can find in the description, the comment section down below, all of that. I have my rookie rankings on there. I also stayed up super late on Sunday night to get out dynasty rankings as well. So my, I have everything completely updated. My top 50 rookie rankings, the RS grades are out, all official. On top of that, you have my top 250 dynasty rankings. So if you have a startup coming up or if you just want to see how these rookies sort of look in the landscape of your dynasty rankings or just the landscape of dynasty in general, that's all there. Now, when we go into this video... We have tiers. Now, of course, the settings for these rankings are tight end premium, super flex, start like 10-ish. So we have tiers, as always, especially right now early in the process, or early in the process of rookie drafts. I feel a lot stronger about the tier breaks than the players within each tier. You can have the players, you know, flip-flopped around within each tier, however you would like, but this is how I see the tier breaks. Depending on team need, the ecosystem of your league, I don't really care if you take, you know, I have a guy 103. If you want to take the guy that's at 105, you can do that. So here at the 101, of course, we have Caleb Williams. I don't want to take a, a long time talking about him, but I do want to say I've kind of contested the idea all offseason that Caleb Williams is not as good of a prospect as Trevor Lawrence. But one, it doesn't really matter a ton. We're still talking about like a generational type quarterback prospect. And then also for Dynasty, I think that he's better in the sense that I don't know about as a pure prospect, but in terms of his landing spot, because we've always known he's going to the Bears, but it's absolutely massive that they went out and they drafted Roma Dunze. So he just has an embarrassment of riches right now, where according to Mike Clay, we're going to be using Mike Clay's projections a lot here. He has his complete projections all done, ready to roll. All the rookies are included, and he has the Bears with the sixth best wide receiver unit, the 10th best offensive line, which is huge. I'm not that in tune with offensive line play, but I do know that they drafted Darnell Wright last year. And it seems like it's a pretty solid offensive line. So they have the 10th best offensive line, the 11th best tight end group. And then when we look at what Trevor Lawrence had here, I mean, this is what he had his rookie year. It's James Robinson, Marvin Jones, LaVisca Chenault, Laquan Treadwell, Agnew, Dan Arnold. I mean, it's just a, a brutal, brutal spot. So when you just put into context, Caleb Williams is going to have, you know, Keenan Allen, DJ Moore, uh, Roma Dunze, who they just drafted, Cole Komet. It's a beautiful, beautiful landing spot. And he has Shane Waldron, who you should be excited about as an offensive coordinator during his time with the Seahawks. 10th in EPA per play, 7th in EPA per rush, 12th in EPA per drop back, 13th in success rate, 10th in neutral pass rate, tied for 5th in neutral pace. So it's up tempo. They pass the ball. They're efficient. Boom. It's beautiful. If you wanted to have, especially again, like Keenan Allen were good, DJ Moore is good, but now you're like locking in somebody for the entirety of his rookie contract in Roma Dunze that now he's going to have weapons at his disposal pretty much the whole time. So that's really exciting. I, I, I could be talked into taking him as high as like the 108, 109 in a startup right now just because of that small little boost that he got. Whereas like before then, he was like a late startup, a late first startup for me. Now, moving on from that, we have our early first tier. If you have a pick from 102 to 105, this is that area. Um, I will say in a little mini tier of his own, I will put Marvin Harrison Jr. I, I don't think that you can, you can't talk me into taking anybody besides Marvin Harrison Jr. at second overall. This is the prince who was promised. I, as corny as it sounds, uh, the market 
is going to care that his last name is Harrison Jr. That's going to hold weight. So to me, I think that he has a high floor. He's not a fragile asset. And when we look at where he grades out on the RS grading system, of course, we're going to be talking about the RS grades a lot in this video. What it is is just my prospect model. Uh, you have legendary, elite, gold, silver, bronze. Each of those hit rate buckets are based on uh, point per game finishes for each position. Marvin Harrison Jr. falls into this bucket here of Jamar Chase, Calvin Johnson, Julio, A.J. Green, uh, Odell Beckham, Des Bryant. I mean, Justin Jefferson. It's uh, an insane group that he's in. And now, to me, he has the best chance of being that next wide receiver to join the uh, Jamar Chase tier, the uh, you know Justin Jefferson, C.D. Lamb tier. To me, he is the heir apparent. Uh, now, in terms of his spot, he goes to the Cardinals here, and that's a pretty good spot. He's going to have Kyler Murray, who we know is a pretty good quarterback. I, I would just say the only thing that's like a bit of a damper uh, is that they're going to be lower volume. Uh, last year, we saw even with like using uh, between like Kyler Murray and Josh Dobbs and everything, uh, they were the second lowest pass volume team last year. So early down pass frequency, they were 31st, only ahead of the Steelers. And when we look at Mike Clay's projections here, they're 14th in dropbacks, their projection. But Kyler Murray's a scrambling quarterback, so only 20th in attempt. So that's a little bit low volume. This is a team that's going to want to run the ball or whatever, but Marvin Harrison Jr., Trey McBride, and then everybody else in this offense, I think it's going to be concentrated, and that should be fine. Uh, and we look at Mike Clay's projections here, which we're going to be looking at a lot because he's very conservative, right? We can see Malik Neighbors, who we're going to talk about next here, is all at the bottom as wide receiver 30. He has Marvin Harrison Jr. as wide receiver 18, which is like probably a record uh, for where Mike Clay is has had a rookie wide receiver for these projections. Again, he's always very conservative with rookies. He's uh, hesitant to move them up too high. And I think that's probably a good thing, right? Like a lot, a lot of us got way over skis last year on JSN um, and Quentin Johnston. And a lot of the rookie wide receivers that pop off, they skew their production in the back half of the season like a Rashi Rice. Uh, and I think if you probably looked back, Rashi Rice probably finished up in like the wide receiver 40. So it's not that crazy. I, I think that he had JSN in the wide receiver 40s as well. Now, that 103 is going to be Malik Neighbors. He goes to the Giants. Uh, I believe like sixth overall he did. And he has Malik Neighbors as the wide receiver 30. And that's fine. Uh, I, I will say I did want to address that I have gotten the question before, right, where, Ron, why don't you trust the RS grades? Malik Neighbors is ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr. Well, there's two reasons. Or there's a few reasons. One, we use tiers over grades. I, I don't just put the numbers through the model and then say, you know what? these are my rankings now. No, I just have the hit rate tiers. And then within each tier, I kind of decide what I like between the two players uh, or how I sort of prefer them in dynasty or fantasy football. Uh, and here, Marvin Harrison Jr. didn't test. I believe if he did kill the combine, like we probably expected him to, he would have been right there next to Malik Neighbors as well. Kyler Murray's better than Daniel Jones. And that's probably, and then also, like I said earlier, Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, holds the name value as like corny as that sounds in the dynasty market people do care about marvin harrison jr it's a name that's been out here for a while pretty much ever since that bowl game uh and like his his final game of his freshman year uh he's had a ton of hype now he goes to uh malik never goes to the giants it's not the sexiest spot in the world but he'll be number one on that depth chart in terms of just receiver you know tight end wide receiver whatever you want to call it and we've seen uh head coach brian dable Stephon Diggs' best years of his career came with Brian Dable in Buffalo. I think that Brian Dable is going to center his offense around Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, or not Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors. And of course, it's not going to be as efficient, right? Because you have Daniel Jones, potentially Drew Locke as well. But he should be the focal point. There should be some junk volume. The defense isn't the best in New York. Uh, and I just, I think you just have to trust the legendary upside, the legendary prospect here. It seems that the market is there as well. So for me... He's just such a safe bet. He's such a strong prospect profile uh, that I have him at 103. But if you wanted to take one of the quarterbacks over Malik Neighbors, I think you could. Now, this is a big discussion point of this entire thing when we talk about strategy. Drake May is my 104. Now, this is what I want to sort of say as like a fat disclaimer for this entire video. I am not going into drafts with my rookie rankings that are on Patreon and just like crossing them off and just drafting directly off of them. You have to be mindful of the landscape, right? It, it, let's say, let's say I had Roma Dunze as my 104, right? Um, I don't. Let's say this is Roma Dunze, and his ADP is the 107. Well, 
you're now turning all if you just sit in the pocket at 104 and take Roman Dunze every single time you're now devaluing your asset of the 104 to the 107 that might be a gap right so the 104 in startups probably goes in at the two three turn of startup drafts whereas that Roma Dunze pick like the 107 or 106 or whatever is probably more of like a fifth round startup pick so if you sit in the pocket and you turn your second third round startup value pick 104 into a Roma Dunze who's more of a fifth round pick you just devalued that rookie pick so you need to be very mindful of the prices of the market and wanting to get the best possible price now that's not you know, trading back to the 107 and praying Roman Dunes that gets there, but it's not sitting in the pocket and taking him way over market and devaluing your rookie picks. So you want to be mindful. You want to be trading back. Uh, this is from, I'll make sure I link this down below. This is from uh, Adeko's ADP. And you can see Drake May is the 106. So I guess Roman Dunes is not a great uh, point. Like it's the same thing. Let's say you have JJ McCarthy uh, as your 104. You don't want to be taking, if you have JJ McCarthy as your 104, you're going to end up with 80% JJ McCarthy exposure. So you have to be mindful of the market. You don't just want to step up, step up to the plate and take your best ranked player. Cause then you're just devaluing your rookie picks, uh, and picking your favorite players. So you want to be trading back. You want to be squeezing out value. Uh, I will say if the difference is like negligible, it's not like a massive, massive deal. It's just something you want to be aware of. And it, it really comes to fruition with Drake May because you're going to see here on this ADP, uh, Jaden Dalen's is at the 103 in rookie ADP. Drake May is the 106. So me having Drake May at 104, and if I just drafted strictly off of these rankings, I would end up with like 80% Drake May and no Jaden Daniels. And I know that that's not smart. So as someone that plays in a lot of dynasty leagues in 11, I'm going to be diversifying a little bit where I'm going to be drafting a lot of Drake May. But I'll probably mix in once or twice a 104 Jaden Daniels just to get him in my portfolio because I understand he's a highly drafted quarterback with a ton of upside. We don't just need to strictly draft off the rankings in every single league because you don't. Even last year, Anthony Richardson was a smash. But if you had 80% Anthony Richardson, you probably didn't win any of those leagues because he did sink your ship while you know giving you future value as well. So it's just something to think about. Uh, and I think you know when I say something to think about, it's actually a really good segue into thinking about thinking. This is Jacob Sanderson's newsletter. It's on Substack. I'll make sure I link it down below as well. Um, and I've had him on the channel before. Uh, and he's one of the best minds in Dynasty, in my opinion. I really like reading his work. He he thinks through everything from a market perspective, and he just has a very uh, unique view on everything. And this is a blurb that he wrote about Drake May. He's similar to us, where he also has Drake May 104 as his QB2. And this is what he said. I think that blindly clicking May at 104 every opportunity is a poor use of your draft capital. And I would agree. Uh, I will be trying to trade down to the 105-106 range to draft May at value in my early drafts and then reassessing if necessary depending on where his ADP settles. I know that I want to be aggressively over the market on this player, but I still want to do it in a way that's price sensitive. So his advice is be over market, but price sensitive. Attempt to position yourself to generate exposure at the 105 and later. And I would agree. Uh, you don't have to step up to the plate like if you're just going to draft off my rankings and take them at the 104 every single time. I actually have in my rookie rankings the target pick. So like where I'm trying to pick these players so while Drake May is my 104, I would like to take him at the 105 or later because there's people, the market loves Jaden Daniels over him. They love Malik Neighbors over him. And I want to be squeezing out some of that value and not just, you know, if you just sit there and take Drake May, you're sacrificing a little bit of value on the margins. But I will say the fat disclaimer here is that if you're in like less than four dynasty leagues, diversifying doesn't really matter for you. Now, when we talk about Drake May and why I have him over Jaden Daniels, it's largely... Uh, two things. One, it's a belief in Drake May's talent. I really do think that he is just the better quarterback prospect. I think that he has a brighter future. And then I also don't believe that Washington is like this massive step up for Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels is going to have Terry McLaurin. And then that's kind of it. I don't really believe in Jahan Dotson or the rest of the receivers that Washington has there. I guess you can kind of believe in like Ertz and Ben Sanat. They have running backs, but that's it. Their offensive line is pretty garbage. The, you know, Washington's not a great organization in general. I don't have a lot of faith in Dan Quinn or Cliff Kingsbury. So I don't know. I think people that are kind of propping up Jaden Daniels because he has a better landing spot. Uh, to me, they're both pretty shitty spots. Uh, if we look at, this is from uh, Mike Clay as well with his unit grades. You can see Patriots are the 31st ranked offensive unit. Washington is 28th. So like we're, again, we're talking like bottom of the barrel. Uh, Washington has the better running backs and wide receiver grades. Whereas New England has the better offensive line and tight end grade. So again, you're like splitting it down the middle. You're splitting hairs. It's just not a big enough difference for me to be like, yeah, I'm going to take Jaden Daniels because his landing spot is so much better. To me, they're both, you know, not great. Uh, now, when we talk about why I like May, 
uh, especially over somebody like Jaden Daniels. It's a bit scary with a guy like Jaden Daniels. He is an older prospect. He's going to be 23 years or older. Theo Asher on Twitter broke it down in a really good way where older quarterback prospects just aren't as clean. Of course, you have Joe Burrow, but the rest of them aren't great. It's like Baker, EJ Manuel, Christian Ponder. Uh, Carson once had his moments, Ryan Tannehill, Kenny Pickett. Daniels isn't as big of a red flag as Nixon Penix, but it's just not great that it took him so long to break out. Uh, and then also, I do just love Drake May, where the upside is absolutely bonkers. He had, like, only him and Mahomes. This is a, this is a uh, chart from Todd on Twitter. I believe it's Dynasty Superflex. And you can see Drake May is only in this area of Pat Mahomes in terms of big-time throws per, per game. They both had, like, over, like, in the high twos, low threes of big-time throws per game during their college careers. You have pressure to sack rate across the bottom, where at Drake May's pressure to sack rate isn't great, but it being under 20% is just fine. Uh, and then on top of that, he was somebody that was asked to do a lot at UNC, which is why I think people are over-dinging him for some of the mistakes there where they asked him to drop back 44 times per game during his career there. The only quarterback asked to do more and drop back more times that was drafted in the first round, Patrick Mahomes, who did it over 50 times in his college career, which did water down uh, some of his like efficiency stats, which is what it did to Drake May, especially in his final year. But even with that, on a per-rate basis, Drake May's big-time throw weight is still crazy. Now, big-time throws are just a PFF grade where if you make a crazy throw, whether it's in a tight window or downfield, you get a big-time throw in your stat sheet. And you can see here, Drake May is at the top. 8.1% is absurd. It's like almost, it's like, what, 1.5% more than CJ Stroud, Caleb Williams, every other quarterback over the last two years. And then on top of that, he scrambles the ball a ton or runs the ball a ton. That's a weird way to say that. But you can see here, this is rushing fantasy points per snap with this class in mind. Jaden Daniels, of course, at the top, but Drake May, not that far behind. Sandwiched between Carson Wentz and Daniel Jones and Josh Allen. So he has plenty of upside on the ground. He has a ton of upside through the air. He's a big kid. Uh, he's young. He won't be 22 until late August. So to me, I want to be betting on Drake May. But again, I want to be cost sensitive. I don't just want to sit at 104 and take him every time. I would like to sort of get him in that 105, 106 range. Then we have Jaden Daniels, which if you want to put him as high as 103, you absolutely can. I, I completely get the appeal. Massive rushing upside. He gets Terry McLaurin. Um, my biggest concern is that I think that he's going to pop off early, give you a QB one point per game season. But I just don't know about him as a long term starter. Uh, when we look at a lot of these like pressure to sack rate stats, he had one of the worst where he had a, what is that, 24.5% pressure to sack rate, one of the worst that we've seen ever. This is Zachary Kruger, a tweet of his where it looks at like career pressure to sack rates uh, in his entire database. And Jaden Daniels is in a pretty rough group there. Uh, on top of that, we have Football Insights. They're a great Twitter account. Uh, you can see the top tweet, highest pressure to sack rate on non blitz dropbacks, which by the way, pressure to sack is just you know, what percent of the time that you get pressure does that turn into a sack, right? That It's just a way of <clears throat> of measuring sack avoidance. We don't want guys to get pressured and take a sack right away because that's just, that's how you stall drives. That's how you get turnovers. It's just not good. Uh, and highest pressure to sack rate on non-blitz dropbacks. So this isn't even on blitzes. Uh, he'll get sacked. Uh, that first one, he's in between Deshaun Kaiser and Christian Hackenberg, which is brutal. Below that round, one and two quarterbacks since 2016 to average less than five yards per dropback. Under pressure and over a 20% sack rate, Zach Wilson, Justin Fields, Will Levis, Christian Hackenberg, Jaden Daniels. It's a brutal, brutal list to be a part of. And then even when you go outside the numbers and you look at the tape, this is a really cool uh, thing that Ben Selleck did. And I believe it was the, damn it, dude. I, it, I'm going to say it was in the Ringers uh, draft guide, which is really cool. And this is pressure response that Ben Selleck does. It's a film study. You can see the method part. Uh, pinpoint percentage is more than just general accuracy. It is... Measures how often the, the situational bars show how a QB's pinpoint percentage changed under various conditions. And the heat map, map showing shows the passing accuracy of a quarterback. Okay, so the pie chart represents a quarterback responded when pressured. And he goes through and he charts all of the throws under pressure. And Jaden Daniels, Ben Sullick said, uh, this is legitimately crazy. I've never had a quarterback prospect under 40% stand and deliver before and certainly not a round one guy. So under pressure, having under, like stand and deliver just means that you stand in the pocket under pressure and you make a good throw. He does not do that. And that's a big issue. He's not throwing the ball away a ton. He's scrambling. He's escaping. But then he's also 23.3% of the time taking a sack. 
So that's just, it, it's tough. Like in the face of pressure, he's not standing in there. He's not throwing. He's not looking to create. He's looking to just sort of take off and scramble. And in the NFL with his frame, I just don't love that long term. He's also an older prospect. There's just some red flags there. But there's certainly a case to be made that you can just draft him, cash in a QB one point per game season, and then once you get to that one-two turn like Justin Fields did after his second year, you hop off the train and sell him. To me, that's a lot of like timing the market and like because then he scores that court QB one points per game season, then you're bought in. You're like, oh my god, he's the next big thing. I don't know. I I, I get it. Again, he's right in that same tier for me. Just I just think that Drake May is cleaner, and I think that he has more rushing upside than he's giving credit been given credit for. Uh, but then moving off to that, we have. My mid first tier. Now, this is 106, 107, 108. I cannot stress enough. In my startup rankings, these guys are literally like 37th, 39th, 40th. You can interchange these guys however you want. At the 106, you can take my 108. At the 108, you can take my 106. I do not care. These guys are literally interchangeable depending on the day of the week. But if I had to step up to the plate and take one of them at the 106, it would be JJ McCarthy. I, 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 I haven't loved AJ McCarthy during this entire process, but he goes to Minnesota, which is a dream, dream landing spot for him. Now, the reason that he's in a tier below is the NFL clearly saw him as a tier below, right? Drake May goes uh, third. Jaden Daniels goes second. Drake May goes after Michael Penix and falls to the 10th overall pick. So if the NFL sees a clear tier break, I don't mind kind of following in suit with that. Uh, but he is a quarterback. We do know in startups, nine of the top 12 picks are quarterbacks. Quarterbacks rule everything around me. JJ McCarthy, for that reason, is my 106. Now, this is a dream landing spot, man. He goes to the Vikings, and it's not just because of the weapons, right? He gets Justin Jefferson. He gets Jordan Addison. He gets an okay offensive line. He gets once TJ Hawkinson's healthy. He get he, he has, you know, arguably the best receiver in the NFL. It's a beautiful, beautiful, you know, dome games as well. It's a beautiful, beautiful landing spot. But what's even better is the scheme fit with Kevin O'Connell, where let's just look at this Hayden Winks tweet on the right here, where this is throws over the middle per football outsiders or football uh, SIS. JJ McCarthy had 45 throws over the middle of the field on digger crossing routes for 2024. And when you extrapolate that out to rates, he had the highest rate in the class. So JJ McCarthy's specialty was throws over the middle of the field. And that is a tough place to attack, right? We've seen a lot with guys like Russell Wilson, where they don't throw over the middle of the field because, you know, good things can happen in the middle of the field, but also bad things can happen in the middle of the field. But Kevin O'Connell is somebody who's utilized throws over the middle field a ton, where last year expected points added per attempt over the middle. You can see Kirk Cousins is behind just Tua, Stroud, and Jalen Hurts. And it's no shocker that, you know, you have Tua from the McDaniel, Shanahan, McVay uh, tree, Stroud, who has Slowick, who's from that same tree, uh, Kirk Cousins, Kevin O'Connell's from that same tree, uh, Jared Goff with uh, Ben Johnson, so a brighter signal caller. So a lot of these, you know, modern offenses that kind of take from the McVay, Shanahan tree that, you know, use your Brock Purdy's and everything, they like to attack the middle of the field. And that's what Kevin O'Connell likes doing. That's what J.J. McCarthy made his you know, his bread with in college. So that's a really, really exciting marriage there, especially it it reminds me a ton of like Shane Steichen with Anthony Richardson. It's a perfect marriage. The quarterback, the team, the coach believes in the quarterback. And then Kevin O'Connell just had Josh Dobbs where Josh Dobbs didn't even know the place. He's feeding them in through the headset and Josh Dobbs is winning football games. So to me, Kevin O'Connell is like the perfect, perfect landing spot for a quarterback. JJ McCarthy, I'm very excited about. And I will say too, when we talk about these quarterbacks, uh, it's important to note that them losing value is definitely a, a really tough proposition. This is actually I, I, I did a I made I had AI do a transcript of JJ Zacharyson's uh, podcast episode where he talked about it on on our show, but he said he did a study where he broke down how much ADP uh, rookie quarterbacks gained or lost in Superflex Dynasty Leagues. And this is what he said. So this is important to note. When we're talking about like these lesser profiles, when we talk about like J.J. McCarthy and Bo Nix, Michael Penix, this is huge for these guys. And he said, uh, he did a study. Uh, so he had 19 quarterbacks in the, that had top 100 Superflex startup ADPs as rookies. He said 16 of those 19 ended up maintaining value. Those 16 either improved on their ADP or they saw it drop by less than a round. And this gets even better when the players performed at a high level as rookies. In our sample... Nine quarterbacks scored 16 or more standard fantasy points per game as first-year players. Of those nine, seven 
played double digit games. So Sam Howell, Anthony Richardson, they get tossed out of the sample because they didn't play that much. Those seven quarterbacks performed well as rookies were Justin Herbert, CJ Stroud, Kyler Murray, Josh Allen, Baker Mayfield, Daniel Jones. Herbert went from an ADP of 89 as a rookie to seven as a second year player. Stroud was 22 and now he's six. Kyler Murray 42, then seven. Josh Allen was 123. He goes to 58th. Baker Mayfield 75th to 14. Dalen Jones 122nd to 53rd. Now I know some of those ADP seem insane because in today's dynasty landscape, rookie quarterbacks should go in the top 10, top 15. They're bound to have higher startup costs. But you can see there is again right. So 16 of those 19 quarterbacks ended up maintaining value. So you have this like really really sweet floor where that quarterback's going to maintain value. Right? We saw with like like. Bryce Young is still like a six round startup pick. He he of course he used to probably be like more of like a, a late second, early third type last year, but he's not nothing. Like now you could probably sell him for like a late first still. So quarterbacks, these young quarterbacks drafted with premium draft capital, they hold value. And then they also have like asymmetrical upside where they can get to those first round of startup drafts with no other position really outside of like, you know, your Jamar Chase Jefferson's have the capability to get to the first round of startups. So something to really uh, think about with these quarterbacks. Now, after that, we have Brock Bowers. Now, again, if you want to have Roma Dunze ahead of him, you absolutely can. But with Brock Bowers, he goes to the Raiders. I get that the landing spot's not ideal, right? The Raiders aren't pretty. They already have Michael Mayer. But this is a tight end. This is a generational tight end. Uh, and I really can't have him much lower. I, it, it's tough to have him much lower. He's a special, special, special talent. Uh, I actually ran him through, just for funsies, I ran him through the wide receiver RS grade model. And this is where he ranks among first round wide receivers who are also elite. He comes out as a, a really low end elite, but that's impressive due to the fact that he didn't have any athletic testing, right? Like tight ends, if you put tight ends through a wide receiver model, their biggest edge on the wide receivers would be their athleticism. So taking that out of the equation and him still being an elite wide or elite wide receiver prospect next to like Demarius Thomas and DeAndre Hopkins and you know even JSN and Jalen Waddle and Devonta Smith, like even a Jerry Judy who is a strong prospect as well, is really crazy. Now people are going to be scared off by Kyle Pitts, and this is where I want to make this a buying opportunity with Brock Bowers. So I actually think that this is a really really good fit for him, just with the quarterbacks here with Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew. People love, love to point out, well, Kyle Pitts, he didn't work out. Same thing's going to happen with Brock Bowers. You said all this stuff about Kyle Pitts. You're saying the thing about Brock Bowers. I'm not in. Well, here's the thing, man. Kyle Pitts is a really good player. He was a really, really good prospect as well. But his issue, he's a high ADOT touchdown dependent wide receiver, tight end, but he plays wide receiver really. And you can see here, I, I compared Brock Bowers to Kyle Pitts, their college PFF stats. And you can see Brock Bowers had an 8.2 average depth of target, Kyle Pitts 11.8. So he's much more of like a downfield receiver, which means if you're going to thrive on downfield targets and touchdowns, you need a quarterback who can be accurate enough to give you the ball, which Kyle Pitts has not had yet. And you need to be on a good offense scoring touchdowns if you're going to be a touchdown scorer he has not had that yet. He has not had a good offense or an accurate quarterback. That's going to change here soon. Uh, maybe we should have known in hindsight that that's kind of what we were signing up for. But to now put that on Brock Bowers, who's this completely other type of tight end, right? Look at this, these stats here. 8.2 yard ADOT. So he's much shallower. He's getting passes before the first down marker. 25% missed tackles forced per reception to Kyle Pitts 10%. So he's much more of this like, get him the ball. Before the first down marker, which again means you don't need to have quarterback talent to get him the ball, and he's just going to make plays and break tackles where 25% missed tackles forced, 8.5 yak per reception is insane. And then, of course, he had 19 rushes, 193 rushing yards, and five rushing touchdowns. So you can give him carries, you can get him out in space, give him screens. Kyle Pitts is not that type of player at all. You can't get him anything manufactured. He has to win as a downfield, like hybrid wide receiver, which he's very good at. But again, you need a quarterback that can throw it accurately to those parts of the field. I think you'll have that now with Kirk Cousins, but putting that on Brock Bowers to me is dumb when they're both like very different types of tight ends. Now, when we talk about that, you know, his ADOT is 8.2. So we're talking before the first down marker, under 10 yards is where a lot of his targets come. We can look at from last year, percentage of attempts thrown and then zero yard to nine yard area Gardner Minshew was fifth with 49.6 percent of his attempts going there and Aiden O'Connell was 48 point uh Aiden O'Connell was seventh with 48.7 percent of his attempts in that zero to nine yard area so both of these quarterbacks are your more field manager check down type quarterbacks 
and that's perfect for Brock Bowers. Now, the biggest hurdle here is going to be that Michael Mayer is there, but I think that them drafting Brock Bowers just kind of tells you where they're at in Michael Mayer. They probably don't see him as like a special, special talent. He'll be in line in the second tight end. Will he maybe eat into some of Brock Bowers' routes? Sure, but I think that we could see Brock Bowers. You know, I would value him similar to like a Dalton Kincaid, where Dalton Kincaid's going to be next to Dawson Knox, but to me, Brock Bowers is much better. He's much younger. He was drafted higher, better prospect, more explosive. So that's kind of like a, a, a juiced up Dalton Kincaid is how I'd be viewing Brock Bowers. And then I think uh, this is also from Jacob Sanderson's uh, Substack. Again, check out Thinking About Thinking. He, he broke down the entire class. It's a really, really good read. Um, but this is, again, with exposure and asset management with Brock Bowers. So I'm at my 107. But he's somebody where he might fall to 108, 109, 110 in a lot of drafts. So you might want, not want to use your 107s on Brock Bowers. Maybe you want to use your 107s on Roma Dunze because, again, these guys are all very, very close. You know that Roma Dunze is not going to fall, but you know that in some drafts, Brock Bowers might be there 108, 109, 110. So what he sort of broke it down was I have these three players in the same tier and I'm less tied. Again, McCarthy, Bowers, Odunze. Uh, Adunze falls to the 107 in just 25% of drafts compared to Brock Bowers at 65%. Given how poor Bowers' landing spot was, I expect that gap to widen as, as we get more post-draft data. Additionally, several influential analysts are ranking Bowers much lower. Uh, JJ Zacharyson has him at the 111 in Superflex. Now, I don't bring that up to get a job at JJ Zacharyson, and I agree. He is one of the best in the game. I bring it up because Late Round Prospect Guide is one of the most subscribed to resources of rookie draft rankings in the industry, and people you release are going to downgrade Brock Bowers because of it. Expect Bowers to become more solidified at the 108 in the coming days and weeks, or even to fall behind Xavier Worthy or Bo Nix in a reasonable amount of drafts, if not an overall ADP. I think that's wrong, and we should take advantage of the chance to select an actually generational prospect in the late first of our drafts and as often as humanly possible, even if the Raiders deserve a healthy dose of skepticism over how Bowers will be used out of the gate. Uh, I'm going to try to trade back from the from most 106 picks to get Bowers and an asset. When I'm able, unable to do that, I will rotate between picking Odunze, McCarthy, and Bowers based on team need for at least the first half of my rookie drafts. From there, I'll draft in accordance with my target exposures and who I need more or less to achieve them. So he has like a very analytical approach to how he, I mean, he has like 30 dynasty leagues, so he sort of has to. And I agree with him. Again, that 106 through 108, if you have to make a pick at 106, if you want to do it off of team need, like maybe you already have good quarterbacks and you need a wide receiver, you could go with Dunze. Like I, I, I'm usually very much against going for team need in rookie drafts, but in the 106 to 108, I think that it's absolutely fine. But again, uh, I don't hate, like he was saying, you know, trade back from 106 to the 108, take one of the three, and then add an asset on top. Uh, so that's kind of how I'm attacking that area. Now, of course, we have a Dunze. You guys aren't going to like that he's my 108. Again, if you want to put him at 106, you absolutely can. I think that he's that good. Um, it's just, you know, it's just a positional value thing, really. Uh, but a Dunze goes to Chicago. He goes in the top 10. People seem to be really scared off, or not really scared off. Maybe it's more of the redraft community, but I have seen a lot of talk on Twitter of, oh my goodness, a Dunze is going to be next JSN, or he's buried on the depth chart year one, and he like loses value. Well, the thing is, JSN is still a top 25 dynasty wide receiver. Like he didn't lose that much value. Like he's probably still a six round startup pick. And Roman Dunze is probably what, like a early fifth right now, late fourth. So, I mean, your floor is JSN where he loses like a round of ADP. To me, that's not uh, a massive, massive deal. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, Clay, of course, like I said earlier, he's very conservative on these things. And even then he has Roma Dunze still getting uh, 100 plus targets. In the Chicago Bears offense, he has Caleb Williams as QB 15, which is really nice. So, I don't know. Uh, the thing is, too, with JSN is that he wasn't good. Like, yes, he was buried, which means you're not going to get a ton of routes, but he still wasn't efficient on his route. So, if a Dunze comes in and he gives you a good yards per out run, a good targets per out run, but it's not, you know, he's not an every week starter in fantasy, and then maybe he's like a Rashi Rice for like the last four weeks, five weeks. You know, you could see a scenario. I'm just, this is sort of fan fiction here, but like Keenan Allen goes down and Dunze comes and he really breaks out for the last four games. And then, boom, heading into next offseason, even though he maybe had like a wide receiver 40 finish, he's a top 12 dynasty wide receiver. So, again, I, I'm not like – and I think on top of that, with the JSN, JSN thing, people seem to have tempered expectations for Omodunze in year one. So, special wide receiver prospect, top 10 drafted, cross reception perception. If you want to have Omodunze higher, you can. I've already taken him in a couple rookie drafts. So, even with having him at like 108 and not being that high on him, again, if I'm in a spot where – I have Sam Laporta, and I have three really good quarterbacks. I'm completely fine sitting in the pocket and just taking Roma Dunze 106. So again, these are my rankings, but within each tier, you can go team need, but be mindful of the market. And again, 
with these three players, they're interchangeable. Now, moving on from that, we have my late first tier. And I will be honest, I, I, I'm not trying to make a lot of picks in this tier. I, I like these players. Um, but some of them fall. Like if, I, if I'm at the 109 and these eight are off the board, I'm not crazy about using that pick. Uh, I would probably trade out of that pick for like a future first and maybe a little juice on top, maybe a little something on top. I did try, like I would try if you're a contender, move off your 109, see if you can get like Devontae Adams in a future first. I know that that sounds crazy, but maybe you add like a future second on your side. Just something I'd be looking into. You don't have to move off of your late first no matter what, um, but they're definitely not, like I, I'd much rather make like the one. 11 because you can kind of get some players to fall i've seen i've seen falling brian thomas juniors i've seen players fall it seems like the market has like this late first and then also this tier down here all jumbled together but if i had to step up to the podium and make a pick it would be xavier worthy now this is my uh this is my pre-draft comps for xavier worthy uh it wouldn't change you know outside of like just the you see how it says dp 31 he would have, uh, what, he went in like, he went like 25th to the Chiefs or whatever, or 27th. Uh, but he officially graded out as elite, and his comps are really fun. It's like Marquise Brown, Percy Harvin, Jalen Waddell, uh, Deshaun Jackson, Zay Flowers, uh, Will Fuller, Henry Ruggs, not as fun. But the way that I'm viewing Xavier Worthy and the other wide receiver I'll have in this tier of uh, Brian Thomas Jr. is they feel a lot to me uh, like Jordan Addison and Zay Flowers last year, and they both ended up doing very well. So, uh, they're both really strong prospects. They're elite prospects in my database. You can see here as well, the, like he, Xavier Worthy has great yards at the catch per reception. His ADOT's like 13.7. He's a big play guy. He can play a little bit in the slide. He can play a little bit on the outside. Uh, there's a lot to like with him. Broke the 40, uh, 40 yard dash record. But to me, he's not Henry Ruggs because he does have production, really good production. He's an elite wide receiver prospect. And I think it's really good that, uh, Ian pointed this out. He's had a 25% target share or more in every collegiate season. Only him and Calvin Ridley have done that uh, in his database, to be a first-round pick and do that in his database. So that's really, really good. Now, he goes to the Chiefs, which is amazing. I will say it's a little bit crowded. Right now, we have Rashi Rice, we have Marquise Brown, we have Travis Kelsey. So he's like fourth at best on the totem pole. So that's a little bit concerning, right? Like, it's not like he's not going to be like, we're going to talk about Ladd McConkie in a little bit here. He's probably not going to like he's, he might be like fourth in routes right out the gate, which is a little bit tough, right? Like we do want them to get on the field to earn opportunities. But for me, you just have to kind of trust Andy Reid traded up for this pick, right? He traded up with the builds. Uh, Andy Reid has used these like, you know, Tyree Kill, Kadarius Tony. He's going to have a plan in place for Xavier Worthy. I know people are going to be scared off by Sky Moore, but Sky Moore is a much uh, a lesser prospect than Xavier Worthy. He was also a second round pick. Xavier Worthy, first round pick, much better prospect here. So I'm still buying. Uh, so I know it's going to be crowded early on. I couldn't tell you how it shakes out in terms of him versus Marquise Brown, the Rashi Rice uh, potential suspension, and then Travis Kelsey. He just signed an extension as well. So it's not there's not a super clear path to him like crushing in year one, but this is a bet on talent and a bet on somebody attached to Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. I don't think that there's really much more you can ask for uh, for a landing spot for a rookie wide receiver. For redraft, he'll be an interesting conversation though because he's somebody... Uh, I don't know when you'd be able to start him, but he could be someone that like crushes uh, late down the stretch next year. Then at the one one ten, I have Brian Thomas Jr. Now this is actually another tier here. I'm gonna have three players here. You can interchange them uh, depending on preference between these two receivers, and then we're gonna talk about a quarterback here, depending on need, preference, flavors, uh, the format of your league, all of that. But we're gonna have Brian Thomas Jr. here. He goes to the Jaguars, which is a really fun landing spot for him. Uh, the Jaguars in Mike Clay's projections, ninth most dropback, seventh most attempts. So it's going to be high volume and it's going to be a really cool and fun marriage with Trevor Lawrence, where if we look at last year, Brian Thomas Jr., this is the top one, uh, on throws 20 yards or more downfield. He had the second most yards in college football last year, 670 yards and 12 touchdowns, 670 yards and 12 touchdowns on just 15 catches. He had a 30.45 yards per route run on targets of over 20 yards. And then last year, when we look at the NFL, the bottom chart, Trevor Lawrence was third in the NFL last year in throws of 20 or more yards. He had 75 attempts of 20 or more yards, the best graded passer of this group, 31 big time throws to six turn worthy plays. That is where Trevor Lawrence excels. He wants to push the ball downfield and Brian Thomas Jr. 
does just that. Now we look at his comps. He also comes out as elite. You have like Michael Crabtree, T. Higgins, Devontae Parker, Mike Williams. It's not beautiful, uh, but I do really like that T. Higgins comp. I think that he can be kind of like that. I don't know that he'll ever be like a, you know, complete alpha number one like a DeAndre Hopkins, but I think T. Higgins is a really good uh, comp for him. Or he, like a, a more explosive juiced up T. Higgins, but similar role, like downfield, 1A, one, one 1B one in an offense, and can still flirt with top 12 point per game finishes. Now at 111, you can argue Bo Nix all the way up to 109, right? Because what we talked about with JJ, where these quarterbacks, when they get draft capital, Bo Nix went 12th overall, as crazy as that is to say, he got draft capital. He's going to be someone that holds value. And then also if, if we look up and Bo Nix is like crushing it this year, he's someone that could move way up to like the second round of startup uh, drafts and like really give you a lot of value gain here. Uh, and I do like Bo Nix. He is somebody, he goes to the Bron- Broncos. And the good thing about the Broncos is they kind of suck. You look at the unit grades on the left. Everything sucks besides the offensive line. The offensive line is really, really good. I believe it's the, uh, I don't have the, it was the seventh best offensive line according to Mike Clay. So that's really good. He's going to have an offensive line and that's perfect for him. because That's exactly what he had at Oregon. He had one of the best offensive lines there. And because of that, he had a really low pressure to sack rate. Where we talked about that earlier with Jaden Daniels, it's his big red flag. For Bo Nix, it's his big green flag. Just 11.6 pressure to sack rate. He's somebody, he's not going to take sacks. He's not going to make dumb plays and turn the ball over. And if you protect him with that offensive line, he's going to make the correct decisions. Now, it's not going to be super explosive, right? They draft Joy Franklin. They have Colton Sutton, but it's not like the, the prettiest supporting cast for him. But he's going to do what he's asked. And you can see here in the team stat rankings, he's projecting, Mike Clay is projecting, this Broncos offense to be 12th in dropbacks and 14th in attempts. So there's going to be some passing volume. He's going to stay upright. It's going to be a a Sean Payton scheme, which I think people should be more excited about. Uh, So I do like Bo Nix. He also has some rushing upside too for fantasy, where if we look at this, Bo Nix had 38 rushing touchdowns in 61 games played to Jaden Daniels 34 and 55 games played. So he is a rushing threat in the end zone or in the red zone. He's not going to take sacks. He's going to thrive behind this offensive line. The supporting cast, again, could be better. uh, But I think that he is going to be just fine. I mean, again, they drafted him. Like, Sean Payton has hitched his wagon to Bo Nix. It either needs to work out with Bo Nix or Sean Payton's retiring. So we at least get this year and probably next year with Bo Nix. He's going to start games. He's probably going to be the week one starter. Like, you know, in other classes, you could argue Bo Nix would have been like a top five pick. Uh, in rookie drafts, you just you, you can't get drafted this high and start games that early and not be valued more in super flex leagues. It's just kind of what it boils down to for me. Now, after that, we have the late first, early second uh, of guys that I'm trying to take it like the 112 at the earliest. But I, I'm really in in a perfect world. I want to be taking these guys at like 201, 202, 203. That that's in a perfect world. But of course, you're gonna have to take one at the 112. And for me, that's Jonathan Brooks. Now, I'll be honest. He was one of the biggest post-draft movers for me. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of Jonathan Brooks like because I didn't mind him. But the torn ACL, and then it seemed like he was just going to get drafted in the third round with everybody else. But the NFL in Carolina made it very clear that they see him in a tier above the rest, and that's huge. Being a top 50 pick at running back is massive, especially in this day and age where running backs don't get drafted highly. Uh, if we look at since... 2018, right before you yeah, had 2017, of course, like Kamara, Kareem Hunt, it's one of the best running back classes of all time. There's no reason to use that in research because it's just a, a bonkers running back class that we probably won't see again. Uh, but 2018 and on, we sort by draft uh, draft pick, and you can see there's like this tier break after that 50th pick, right? Charbonnet, Akers, Miles Sanders, J.K. Dobbins, you know, some of them injuries, right? Darius Geis is on there too. Uh, but if you look at the top of this and just look at top 50 picks, Every single one of them has a top 24 finish, man, which is bonkers, right? Jonathan Brooks goes 46 overall, all the top 50 picks that won in the second round, Javante, DeAndre Swift, Nick Chubb, Brees Hall, Ronald Jones, Kenneth Walker, Jonathan Taylor, Carryon Johnson. It's not a perfect list, but all of those guys are at least given enough opportunity to give you an RB2 point per game finish, which is damn good. And on top of that, Jonathan Brooks is only 20 years old, right? He's the youngest guy, right? In the, in the furthest to right column, the youngest guy on this entire list, which is insane. So when we talk about Jonathan Brooks, the asset, it gets a little bit sketchy, right? Where he is coming off an ACL tear, but I'm not as worried as I, as I should be for a few reasons. One of them is age, only 20 years old. Uh, that's huge. So we're going to look up in like a year 
and he's going to be somebody where he doesn't turn 22 until July heading into year two. So we're going to look up next year. The season's going to end, and we're going to look up, and Jonathan Brooks is going to be like 21 years old in this like nasty running back landscape, and he's just going to be pushed up because of that. I actually I did my dynasty rankings, and I had a hard time keeping outside of my top 12 dynasty running back rankings just because top 50 draft capital, 20 years old, he catches passes. There's a lot to like here. And then on top of that, again, with the ACL, if it was that big of a red flag, he wouldn't have gotten drafted in the top 50, right? And then on top of that, you have a lot of these uh, injury analysts on Twitter saying that he should be good to go. Uh, this is from an Adam Schefter uh, article. Jonathan Brooks not torn. If he didn't tore his, tear his ACL, he would have been a uh, round one pick. Whichever team drafts Brooks is still likely to happen for training camp. He had surgery uh, December 1st, was told he would be fully recovered in nine months and already is running. The team that drafts him likely would be getting a discount due to the knee injury with the player still likely to make an impact during the 2024 season. Then we have this from Twitter, Jeff Mueller. Uh, he said, from what I've seen and heard, it was a fairly clean ACL injury. So 10-month tracks for JB's return. I bet he participates in preseason to a small extent. So he seems like he's going to be ready to go week one. I would kind of treat him similar to kind of how we viewed Brees last year. Uh, and like similar to Gibbs as well, where we were frustrated. I know that Gibbs wasn't coming off an ACL tear, but we were, we were frustrated with him out the gate. He wasn't being used a ton. Uh, I think we'll have similar issues with Jonathan Brooks, where the first six weeks, it's going to test your patience. It's not going to be fun. Maybe the first eight weeks, and maybe you get down. Maybe he even has a price dip. But then after that, I could easily see him, you know, ending the season on a strong enough note that that optimism carries him into the offseason, and he just, you know, gains a ton of value or not gains a ton of value but holds a ton of value as like a top 12 dynasty running back and he'll have that built-in excuse of oh well he wasn't that great in year one well he was coming off a torn acl and he has top 50 draft capital and he's super young in a dynasty landscape where the running backs suck across the board so he just to me makes a ton of sense uh we'll also see that he's now in carolina with dave canales the head coach uh of course they have miles Sanders and chuba hubbard both guys were Miles Sanders was dust last year. Chuba Hubbard's a day three pick. I'm not all that concerned about them. Dave Canales is kind of spearheading a new regime here. And he just used Rashad White to the tune of like 270 rushing uh, 270 rushing attempts. Um, we look at expected points per game, which is just your attempts, red zone attempts, right? Like your targets, how many points per game should you have based on your volume? Rashad White was at 16 points per game as the RB9 last year in volume. So we already know Canales wants to use one running back, make him the all-purpose back. I think we're going to see Jonathan Brooks in that role. And then again, in Mike Clay's projections where he's very conservative on rookies, you have Jonathan Brooks as the RB20 out the gate in those projections. There's a lot to like here. I also ran them through my uh, database and we sort your round two running backs by receiving points per game. He comes out really clean. Where of course at the top, you have Brian Leonard, Giovanni Bernard, Dexter McCluster. That's not good, but those are like your satellite backs. When you go to this like Mixon, Jonathan Brooks, Matt Forte, Brees Hall, Sean McCoy, Dalvin Cook, green zone, that's a beautiful, beautiful spot to be. So again, he has size, he has youth, draft capital, he catches passes. There's really a lot to like. I can't put him much further down than this. He does grade out as silver for me, but if he did test, I believe that he would be a gold. Now after that, our 201, this one's controversial. I have Keon Coleman. We're going to kind of, this is kind of going to be a, a two- you know, we're going to talk about Keon Coleman and Ladd McConkey here because they are the decision point in drafts. They are back to back a lot. Consensus has Ladd McConkey over Keon Coleman. And this is my line in the sand. All right. I think Keon Coleman is a slam dunk pick in the early second round. He goes to the Buffalo Bills. We'll do a slim shady uh, breakdown here where we'll go, we'll go through the flaws. I, I know, you know, I know every, I, I know everything you're going to say about me. All right. Keon Coleman. Bad reception perception, right? Everything sucks besides the flat. Again, that's Matt Harmon's reception perception. Make sure you check him out. Uh, he said, overall, Keon Coleman is going to be a very team-specific player to project. There are certain coaching staffs I trust to see the vision for his NFL role as a power slot receiver, and some I would not. Uh, a good handful of teams already have this player. This is a prospect with clear weaknesses that will limit his deployment in the league, but given his the right positional framework, he possesses many enviable skills as a receiver to shine in the right role. So he's saying that he needs to be this like power big slot. He goes to the Bills who already have Don Kincaid, who is that, and then Curtis Samuel and Akilah Shakur, two other slot receivers. He will not be playing slot. He will be on the outside. This could 110% be Traylon Burks all over again, right? Where we get this big, fun, athletic receiver that played a lot of like 
slot and kind of like Mickey Mouse routes in college have to win as a big boy on the outside in the NFL. It could go horribly wrong. But you do have to remember, we talk about these wide receiver archetypes of your Traylon Burks, your Quentin Johnstons, your Nikhil Harrys of these like big wide receivers, ton of upside. We took them all in like the middle of the first round of rookie drafts. This is now we're talking early second. So it's a much cheaper bet to make on that same type of upside. Um, and I do like betting on that with Keon Coleman. Now, of course, those are not the only red flags, right? When we look at uh, yards per out run, this is career yards per run and first downs per out run. Ladd McConkey has him absolutely killed in those. Then you have the contested catch stuff. Keon Coleman, 26% of his career targets in college were contested. That's not good. We have kind of a danger zone here above Keon Coleman. You have like David Bell, Terrace Marshall, Nikhil Harry, Quentin Johnston, Denzel Mims, Nico Collins. Or Nico Collins is actually the one hit you can kind of talk yourself into. But then on the other side of Keon Coleman, Terry McLaurin, T. Higgins, uh, George Pickens, Jamar Chase. So it, it's like, you know, which side of that coin do you think he is? I don't mind betting that he is on the other side of that coin. I kind of like to bet on him to be more Nico Collins, more T. Higgins, more Terry McLaurin than a J.J. Arcega white side. He is, you know, somebody that you can take in the early second. He's not going to be 21 until May 17th. He's a good athlete. He played basketball at Michigan State as a freshman, at Michigan State as well. He outproduced Jaden Reed, who we know is a good pro in the NFL. He had a great year last year. So we have production. We have early breakout rate. This was Keon Coleman's second year as like an 18, 19-year-old sophomore at Michigan State. And then on top of that, He's attached to Josh Allen as the wide receiver one in this offense. And if he can somehow find a way to win attached to Josh Allen as a real wide receiver in the NFL, he could pay off in such a massive way that he just wins really big. And that's why I have a hard time quitting him. When we look at his uh, comps from before the draft here, you have, you know, as a ceiling, you have like Alshon Jeffrey and Allen Robinson and Drake London and Juju Smith-Schuster. Like, him being, he could easily be like early career Juju Smith-Schuster. As much people love to say like, oh, Juju sucks. Early career Juju Smith-Schuster was that guy. Uh, Nico Collins is in that mix as well. But he 100% could be Nikhil Harry. He 100% could be Terrace Marshall. So there's clear, clear downside. Uh, but at this price of early second, I'm taking a swing on Keon Coleman. And again, for a guy in Mike Clay that's conservative on these projections, he has Keon Coleman as the wide receiver one in this offense, second to only Dalton Kincaid in targets, and even then, only like six targets behind Dalton Kincaid. So I love that. Josh Allen's wide receiver one, super young, a lot of upside. I really can't put him much lower than that. The R's grades also absolutely love him. He comes out as a gold wide receiver prospect, whereas Ladd McConkey comes out as a silver. Um, but with Ladd McConkey, there is a lot of nuance needed in his profile, right? Where he comes out, his issue is that his yards per run is really good, but his overall production is not good. So he's going to go kind of under the radar in a lot of these models. Uh, but we can see here when we look at uh, Mike Clay's projections, again, he's very conservative. Uh, he has Roma Dunze, then Ladd McConkey, then Brian Thomas Jr., then Keon Coleman, all separated by five PPR points this year. So I don't think it's that crazy to like Keon Coleman over these guys. All of them project very similar. Now, when we look at Ladd McConkey and what there is to like here, it's of course the yards prout run, the first down prout run. When he's on the field, when he's running routes, good things happen. You have the reception perception breakdown here, 85th percentile versus man, 81st percentile versus zone. He's really good as like this slot flanker. And that's what he's going to be in this Los Angeles Chargers offense. Now, the reason why he gets dinged in my model, it doesn't look as good is because of this. It's just PPR points per game, right? That's what we're looking for. Uh, and we look at by year in college, Keon Coleman had that big second year breakout, down year in year three, but outproduces Ladd McConkey every step of the way. And the issue for me with Ladd McConkey is like, I get it, the per route stuff, I get it all, but you would really hope for this final year, his fourth year, for him to have like a, a huge breakout, not even a breakout, but just like, you know, like you, you could forgive Devontae Smith coming out as a senior because his final year, he won a Heisman. Ladd McConkey, I don't think he even broke a thousand receiving yards in his final year. So that's a little bit tough for me to wrestle with. And again, I get I, I get it. He dealt with injuries. Georgia had a lot of studs, right, with your Brock Bowers of the world. So it's tough. Like I I, I go back and forth because I, I know my model is not going to like the lack of production. I know the per out stuff is really juicy. I know the reception perception data is really juicy. I know the landing spot's juicy too, right? He goes to the Chargers with Justin Herbert, and he's going to be the wide receiver one there. He's going to be pretty much the safety blanker. He's going to play like slot, flanker, get open, get separation. There's a very, very high floor there. Um, and I could very much see myself looking back on this very similar uh, to kind of, you know, 
your Jordan Addison's and Crystal Laves, where I discounted the ability to just come into the NFL and run clean routes. Uh, and this could come back in my face, but I will say like 202 is not that crazy. I've already drafted one Lad McConkey share in a league. So he's not like old me would have had him at like 207. I cannot stress enough. Old me would have had him behind Ricky Pearsall, behind Xavier Leggett because they got first round draft capital, probably even behind AD Mitchell as like a mid to late second Lad McConkey. So I'm, I'm, I'm adapting. I am. I'm moving him up. Uh, but I, I, my good buddy, and we mentioned him in this video, Jacob Sanderson, uh, he has my, as his 109 over Xavier Worthy, over Brian Thomas Jr. I can't get there. I get it. I just fundamentally can't get there. If you want to have Ladd McConkey at the top of this tier, you can absolutely go ahead. Again, that's why we use tiers. Now, our last player we're going to talk through is Michael Penix. My first note I have here for Michael Penix is Atlanta, what the fuck? I mean, this was insane. They take him eighth overall. He goes to Atlanta. And of course, the elephant in the room is they just gave this contract to Kirk Cousins. $100 million guaranteed at signing. You can't cut him until after 26. I guess you could cut him after 2025, but you're eating $35 million in dead cap. He, he's going to be playing 2024 and 2025 on this contract. So that's minimum two years that Michael Penix is going to be collecting dust. Michael Penix is already 24 years old. I mean, maybe if you're Michael Penix believer, you are hoping, or not hoping, but you're, I mean, maybe Kirk Cousins' Achilles isn't as healed up as we once thought. It's brutal, though. Like, I, I that's, it, it's a really weird uh, profile here. He's, because again, he's already 24. Like, Jordan Love, the, the whole idea of like, oh, well, he's going to be the next Jordan Love. Well, Jordan Love was 20, and he had like all the tools in the world, and he wasn't drafted top 10. He was drafted in the 20s. So this Penix pick is just bonkers. Now, this is where, it's, it's confusing. I looked up the rookie quarterbacks since the year 2000 to have less than 100 pass attempts in their rookie year. Uh, the left chart is since 2007. The right chart is since 2000, highlighting the players that were missing in the first chart on the left-hand side. It's a mixed bag. You know, you have Brady Quinn, Johnny Manziel, Jamarcus Russell, Jake Locker, Tim Tebow, Paxton Lynch, uh, Rex Grossman. But then you also have Pat Mahomes, Jordan Love, uh, Chad Pennington, Philip Rivers, Aaron Rodgers. So it's like, I don't know. It, it's a mixed bag. There's a very wide range of outcomes here. Maybe you believe that he can be like Aaron Rodgers and sit for a while. But the issue I have then, it, it, this is this is going to be what it comes down to Michael Penix. And it's going to be for all of us to decide. Does Michael Penix, he's, he went eighth overall. Does he fit into the J.J. Zacharyson tier of he's not going to lose value after a year, right? He We're going to look back. We're going to look forward to this next season. And he's not going to lose value. Or... Is he going to be like Jordan Love or like Hendon Hooker? Where we look here, this is Jordan Love's keep trade cut value. You can see, since the rookie draft, it's been nothing but him just falling and falling and falling and falling. And then there was this dead spot, and then, boom, he skyrocketed since. Then you also have Hendon Hooker. This is Hendon Hooker's keep trade cut value. Since his rookie draft, he has done nothing but lose value. So this is what you have to this is what you have to decide with Michael Penix. Is the market going to value that he went eighth overall and going to hold the line even if he doesn't play a single snap next year, or is he just going to collect dust and lose value like Jordan Love and Hendon Hooker? My take is I think that he's going to lose value like your Jordan Love, like your Hendon Hooker. I think that there's going to be better times to buy into Michael Penix, right? Where right now it's taking like a late first, early second. I think there's going to be times next year where you can send an, uh, a random second or there's going to be times next year where you can just send a running back or a veteran to, to a team and get him if you'd like to that way. Um, but it's just tough. I mean, when we talk about him as an actual player, this is also, you know, there's also the idea of, okay, you take that on, you're sitting and you're waiting. What are you sitting and waiting on, right? The issue is, is that he's not this like, if, if let's say this was Anthony Richardson, right? Where like Anthony Richardson's like this like, crazy tools, athleticism, raw quarterback. He's going to sit behind the Kirk Cousins for a while. I could buy in. But with Michael Penix, it's like, what are you winning when you win? He's 24. He also doesn't run the ball at all. Like This is what he falls into. He, he comes out as a gold statue quarterback. This is his bucket. It's Bradford, Stafford, Goff, Mac Jones, Darnold, Russell, uh, Dwayne Haskins, Josh Rosen, Mark Sanchez. It's a, you know, of this list, only Mark Sanchez, Stafford, and Goff have top 12 seasons. Only Stafford has a top five point per game season. Maybe he's Matthew Stafford, but him being between Goff and Mac Jones sounds about right. So that's kind of the biggest issue. It's like, what is even the payoff? I guess the payoff is that he starts games and he just rockets in value and then you trade him there. It's just tough. I, I don't know that I want to hold on to that and just hope for it. Um, 
at the 203 is where I get comfortable doing that. But before then, uh, it's a tough value proposition for me. Now, that's going to do it for us today. I'll leave this on the screen for you guys so you can just kind of see what I have in terms of my rankings. If you want the entire, I have my top 50 ranked. So if you have like a fourth round in your rookie draft, I have my top 50 rookie draft rankings. They are all on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. You can find that in the description. You can find them in the comment section down below. Again, it's my top 50. They're tiered. The RS grades are in the rankings. They're landing spots in the rankings. And I have my target pick for each player. So again, I have Drake May at my 104, but I am looking to draft them at the 105 or later. All of my target areas, my target picks are on those rookie rankings. Now, if you can't support me there, it's all good. I appreciate you guys just watching videos, sticking around, leaving a like on these videos, leaving comments. It all goes a long, long way in the algorithm. Regardless, I appreciate you guys for watching and I will see y'all in the next one.